Here we may profitably devote a few paragraphs to the subject of the training and position of woman. The female half of our species has sometimes been called the paragon of paradoxes because the intuitive working of its mind is beyond the comprehension of men's arithmetical understanding. The Chinese ideogram denoting the mysterious, the unknowable, consists of two parts, one meaning young and the other woman, because the physical charms and delicate thoughts of the fair sex are above the coarse mental caliber of our sex to explain. In the Bushido ideal of woman, however, there is little mystery and only a seeming paradox. I have said that it was Amazonian, but that is only half the truth. Ideographically, the Chinese represent wife by a woman holding a broom. Certainly not to brandish it offensively or defensively against her conjugal ally, neither for witchcraft but for the more harmless uses for which the besom was first invented. The idea involved being thus not less homely than the etymological derivation of the English wife, weaver, and daughter, Tuhita, her milkmaid. Without confining the sphere of woman's activity to kuch, kuch, and kinder, as the present German Kaiser is said to do, the Bushido ideal of womanhood was preeminently domestic. These seeming contradictions, domesticity and Amazonian traits, are not inconsistent with the precepts of knighthood, as we shall see. Bushido being a teaching primarily intended for the masculine sex, the virtues it prized in woman were naturally far from being distinctly feminine. Winkelmann remarks that the supreme beauty of Greek art is rather male than female and Lecky adds that it was true in the moral conception of the Greeks, as in their art. Bushido similarly praised those women most who emancipated themselves from the frailty of their sex and displayed an heroic fortitude worthy of the strongest and the bravest of men. Young girls, therefore, were trained to repress their feelings, to indurate their nerves, to manipulate weapons, especially the long-handled sword called naginata, so as to be able to hold their own against unexpected odds. Yet the primary motive for exercises of this martial character was not for use in the field. It was twofold, personal and domestic. Woman, owning no suzerain of her own, formed her own bodyguard. With her weapon she guarded her personal sanctity with as much zeal as her husband did his masters. The domestic utility of her warlike training was in the education of her sons, as we shall see later. Fencing and similar exercises, if rarely of practical use, were a wholesome counterbalance to the otherwise sedentary habits of woman. But these exercises were not followed only for hygienic purposes. They could be turned into use in times of need. Girls, when they reached womanhood, were presented with dirks, kaiken, pocket poniards, which might be directed to the bosom of their assailants, or, if advisable, to their own. The latter was very often the case, and yet I will not judge them severely. Even the Christian conscience, with its horror of self-immolation, will not be harsh with them, Seeing Pelagia and Domnina, two suicides, were canonized for their purity and piety. When a Japanese Virginia saw her chastity menaced, she did not wait for her father's dagger. Her own weapon lay always in her bosom. It was a disgrace to her not to know the proper way in which she had to perpetrate self-destruction. For example, little as she was taught in anatomy, she must know the exact spot to cut in her throat. She must know how to tie her lower limbs together with a belt, so that, whatever the agonies of death might be, her corpse be found in utmost modesty with the limbs properly composed. 
Is not a caution like this worthy of the Christian Perpetua or the Vestal Cornelia? I would not put such an abrupt interrogation were it not for a misconception based on our bathing customs and other trifles that chastity is unknown among us. On the contrary, chastity was a preeminent virtue of the samurai woman, held above life itself. A young woman taken prisoner, seeing herself in danger of violence at the hands of the rough soldiery, says she will obey their pleasure, provided she be first allowed to write a line to her sisters, who more has dispersed in every direction. When the epistle is finished, off she runs to the nearest well and saves her honor by drowning. The letter she leaves behind ends with these verses. For fear lest clouds may dim her light, should she but graze this nether sphere, the young moon poised above the height doth hastily betake to flight. It would be unfair to give my readers an idea that masculinity alone was our highest ideal for woman. Far from it. Accomplishments and the gentler graces of life were required of them. Music, dancing, and literature were not neglected. Some of the finest verses in our literature were expressions of feminine sentiments. In fact, women played an important role in the history of Japanese belles lettres. Dancing was taught, I am speaking of samurai girls and not of geisha, only to smooth the angularity of their movements. Music was to regale the weary hours of their fathers and husbands. Hence it was not for the technique, the art as such, that music was learned, for the ultimate object was purification of heart, since it was said that no harmony of sound is attainable without the player's heart being in harmony with herself. Here again we see the same idea prevailing which we notice in the training of youths, that accomplishments were ever kept subservient to moral worth. Just enough of music and dancing to add grace and brightness to life, but never to foster vanity and extravagance. I sympathize with the Persian prince who, when taken into a ballroom in London and asked to take part in the merriment, bluntly remarked that in his country they provided a particular set of girls to do that kind of business for them. The accomplishments of our women were not acquired for show or social ascendancy. They were a home diversion, and if they shone in social parties, it was as the attributes of a hostess in other words, as a part of the household contrivance for hospitality. Domesticity guided their education. It may be said that the accomplishments of the women of old Japan, be they martial or pacific in character, were mainly intended for the home. And however far they might roam, they never lost sight of the hearth as the center. It was to maintain its honor and integrity that they slaved, drudged, and gave up their lives. Night and day, in tones at once firm and tender, brave and plaintive, they sang to their little nests. As daughter, woman sacrificed herself for her father, as wife, for her husband, and as mother, for her son. Thus from earliest youth she was taught to deny herself. Her life was not one of independence, but of dependent service. Man's helpmeet, if her presence is helpful, she stays on the stage with him. If it hinders his work, she retires behind the curtain. Not infrequently does it happen that a youth becomes enamored of a maiden who returns his love with equal ardor. But when she realizes his interest in her makes him forgetful of his duties, disfigures her person that her attractions may cease. Adzma, the ideal wife in the minds of samurai girls, finds herself loved by a man who, in order to win her affection, conspires against her husband. Upon pretense of joining in the guilty plot, she manages in the dark to take her husband's place, and the sword of the lover assassin descends upon her own devoted head. The following epistle, written by the wife of a young daimyo before taking her own life, needs no comment. Oft have I heard that no accident or chance ever mars the march of events here below, and that all moves in accordance with a plan. 
to take shelter under a common bough or a drink of the same river is alike ordained from ages prior to our birth. Since we were joined in ties of eternal wedlock, now two short years ago, my heart hath followed thee, even as its shadow followeth an object, inseparably bound heart to heart, loving and being loved. Learning but recently, however, that the coming battle is to be the last of thy labor and life, take the farewell greeting of thy loving partner. I have heard that Ko Wu, the mighty warrior of ancient China, lost a battle, loathed apart with his favorite Gu. Yoshinaka, too, brave as he was, brought disaster to his cause, too weak to bid prompt farewell to his wife. Why should I, to whom earth no longer offers hope or joy, why should I detain thee or thy thoughts by living? Why should I not rather await thee on the road which all mortal kind must sometime tread? Never, prithee, never forget the many benefits which our good master Hidayori hath heaped upon thee. The gratitude we owe him is as deep as the sea and as high as the hills. Woman's surrender of herself to the good of her husband, home, and family was as willing and honorable as the man's self-surrender to the good of his lord and country. Self-renunciation, without which no life enigma can be solved, was the keynote of the loyalty of man, as well as of the domesticity of woman. She was no more the slave of man than was her husband of his liege lord, and the part she played was recognized as Naijo, the inner help. In the ascending scale of service stood woman who annihilated herself for man, that he might annihilate himself for the master, that he in turn might obey heaven. I know the weakness of this teaching, and that the superiority of Christianity is nowhere more manifest than here in that it requires of each and every living soul direct responsibility to its Creator. Nevertheless, as far as the doctrine of service the serving of a cause higher than one's own self, even at the sacrifice of one's individuality. I say the doctrine of service, which is the greatest that Christ preached and is the sacred keynote of his mission, as far as that is concerned, Bushido is based on eternal truth. My readers will not accuse me of undue prejudice in favor of slavish surrender to volition. I accept in a large measure the view advanced with breadth of learning and defended with profundity of thought by Hegel that history is the unfolding and realization of freedom. The point I wish to make is that the whole teaching of Bushiro was so thoroughly imbued with the spirit of self-sacrifice that it was required not only of woman but of man. Hence, until the influence of its precepts is entirely done away with, our society will not realize the view rashly expressed by an American exponent of women's rights, who exclaimed, May all the daughters of Japan rise in revolt against ancient customs! Can such a revolt succeed? Will it improve the female status? Will the rights they gain by such a summary process repay the loss of that sweetness of disposition that gentleness of manner which are their present heritage? Was not the loss of domesticity on the part of Roman matrons followed by moral corruption too gross to mention? Can the American reformer assure us that a revolt of our daughters is the true course for their historical development to take? These are grave questions. Changes must and will come without revolts. In the meantime, let us see whether the status of the fair sex under the Bushido regimen was really so bad as to justify a revolt. We hear much of the outward respect European knights paid to God and the ladies, the incongruity of the two terms making Gibbon blush. We are also told by Halam that the morality of chivalry was coarse, that gallantry implied illicit love. The effect of chivalry on the weaker vessel was food for reflection on the part of philosophers. Mr. Guizot contending that feudalism and chivalry wrought wholesome influences, while well, Mr. Spencer tells us that in a militant society, and what is feudal society if not militant, 
the position of woman is necessarily low, improving only as society becomes more industrial. Now, is Mr. Guizot's theory true of Japan, or is Mr. Spencer's? In reply, I might aver that both are right. The military class in Japan was restricted to the samurai, comprising nearly two million souls. Above them were the military nobles, the daimyo, and the court nobles, the kuge, these higher sybaritical nobles being fighters only in name. Below them were masses of the common people, mechanics, tradesmen, and peasants whose life was devoted to arts of peace. Thus what Herbert Spencer gives as the characteristics of a militant type of society may be said to have been exclusively confined to the samurai class, while those of the industrial type were applicable to the classes above and below it. This is well illustrated by the position of woman, for in no class did she experience less freedom than among the samurai. Strange to say, the lower the social class, as for instance among small artisans, the more equal was the position of husband and wife. Among the higher nobility, too, the difference in the relations of the sexes was less marked, chiefly because there were few occasions to bring the differences of sex into prominence, the leisurely nobleman having become literally effeminate. Thus, Spencer's dictum was fully exemplified in old Japan. As to Guizot's, those who read his presentation of a feudal community will remember that he had the higher nobility especially under consideration, so that his generalization applies to the daimyo and the kuge. I shall be guilty of gross injustice to historical truth if my words give one a very low opinion of the status of woman under Bushiro. I do not hesitate to state that she was not treated as man's equal, but until we learn to discriminate between difference and inequalities, there will always be misunderstandings upon this subject. When we think in how few respects men are equal among themselves, for example, before law courts or voting polls, it seems idle to trouble ourselves with a discussion on the equality of sexes. When the American Declaration of Independence said that all men were created equal, it had no reference to their mental or physical gifts. It simply repeated what Ulpian long ago announced, that before the law, all men are equal. Legal rights were in this case the measure of their equality. Were the law the only scale by which to measure the position of woman in a community, it would be as easy to tell where she stands as to give her avoir du pas in pounds and ounces. But the question is, is there a correct standard in comparing the relative social position of the sexes? Is it right? Is it enough to compare women's status to man's, as the value of silver is compared with that of gold, and give the ratio numerically? Such a method of calculation excludes from consideration the most important kind of value which a human being possesses, namely the intrinsic. In view of the manifold variety of requisites for making each sex fulfill its earthly mission, the standard to be adopted in measuring its relative position must be of a composite character. Or, to borrow from economic language, it must be a multiple standard. Bushido had a standard of its own, and it was binomial. It tried to gauge the value of woman on the battlefield and by the hearth. There she counted for very little, here for all. The treatment accorded to her corresponded to this double measurement. As a social-political unit, not much. While as wife and mother she received highest respect and deepest affection. Why among so military a nation as the Romans were their matrons so highly venerated? Was it not because they were matrona, mothers? Not as fighters or lawgivers, but as their mothers did men bow before them. So with us. While fathers and husbands were absent in field or camp, the government of the household was left entirely in the hands of mothers and wives. The education of the young, even their defense, was entrusted to them. The warlike exercises of women, 
of which I have spoken were primarily to enable them intelligently to direct and follow the education of their children. I have noticed a rather superficial notion prevailing among half-informed foreigners that because the common Japanese expressions for one's wife is my rustic wife and the like, she is despised and held in little esteem. When it is told that such phrases as my foolish father, my swinish son, my awkward self, etc., are in common use, is not the answer clear enough? To me it seems that our idea of marital union goes in some ways further than the so-called Christian. Man and woman shall be one flesh. The individualism of the Anglo-Saxon cannot let go of the idea that husband and wife are two persons, hence when they disagree their separate rights are recognized, and when they agree they exhaust their vocabulary in all sorts of silly pet names and nonsensical blandishments. It sounds highly irrational to our ears when a husband or wife speaks to a third party of his other half, better or worse, as being lovely, bright, kind, and what not. Is it good taste to speak of one's self as my bright self, my lovely disposition, and so forth? We think praising one's own wife or one's own husband is praising a part of one's own self and self-praise is regarded, to say the least, as bad taste among us, and, I hope, among Christian nations, too. I have diverged at some length because the polite debasement of one's consort was a usage most in vogue among the samurai. The Teutonic races beginning their tribal life with a superstitious awe of the fair sex, though this is really wearing off in Germany, and the Americans beginning their social life under the painful consciousness of the numerical insufficiency of women, who, now increasing are, I am afraid, fast losing the prestige their colonial mothers enjoyed. The respect man pays to woman has in Western civilization become the chief standard of morality. But in the martial ethics of Bushido, the main watershed dividing the good and the bad was sought elsewhere. It was located along the line of duty which bound man to his own divine soul and then to other souls in the five relations I have mentioned in the early part of this paper. Of these we have brought to our readers' notice loyalty, the relation between one man as vassal and another as lord. Upon the rest I have only dwelt incidentally as occasion presented itself because they were not peculiar to Bushido. Being founded on natural affections, they could but be common to all mankind, though in some particulars they may have been accentuated by conditions which its teachings induced. In this connection, there comes before me the peculiar strength and tenderness of friendship between man and man, which often added to the bond of brotherhood a romantic attachment, doubtless intensified by the separation of the sexes in youth, a separation which denied to affection the natural channel open to it in Western chivalry, or in the free intercourse of Anglo-Saxon lands. I might fill pages with Japanese versions of the story of Damon and Pythias, or Achilles and Patroclos, or tell in Bushido parlance of ties as sympathetic as those which bound David and Jonathan. It is not surprising, however, that the virtues and teachings unique in the precepts of knighthood did not remain circumscribed to the military class. This makes us hasten to the consideration of the influence of Bushido on the nation at large. We have brought into view only a few of the more prominent peaks which rise above the range of knightly virtues, in themselves so much more elevated than the general level of our national life. As the sun in its rising first tips the highest peaks with russet hue, and then gradually casts its rays on the valley below, so the ethical system which first enlightened the military order drew in course of time followers from amongst the masses. Democracy raises up a natural prince for its leader, and aristocracy infuses a princely spirit among the people. Virtues are no less contagious than vices. There needs but one wise man in a company, and all are wise, 
so rapid is the contagion, says Emerson. No social class or caste can resist the diffusive power of moral influence. Prate as we may of the triumphant march of Anglo-Saxon liberty, rarely has it received impetus from the masses. Was it not rather the work of the squires and gentlemen? Very truly does Mr. Taine say, These three syllables, as used across the channel, summarize the history of English society. Democracy may make self-confident retorts to such a statement and fling back the question, When Adam delved and Eve spun, where then was the gentleman? All the more pity that a gentleman was not present in Eden. The first parents missed him sorely and paid a high price for his absence. Had he been there, not only would the garden have been more tastefully dressed, but they would have learned without painful experience that disobedience to Jehovah was disloyalty and dishonor, treason and rebellion. What Japan was, she owed to the samurai. They were not only the flower of the nation, but its root as well. All the gracious gifts of heaven flowed through them. Though they kept themselves socially aloof from the populace, they set a moral standard for them and guided them by their example. I admit Bushido had its esoteric and exoteric teachings. These were eudaimonistic, looking after the welfare and happiness of the commonality, while those were aretaic, emphasizing the practice of virtues for their own sake. In the most chivalrous days of Europe, knights formed numerically but a small fraction of the population. But, as Emerson says, in English literature, half the drama and all the novels, from Sir Philip Sidney to Sir Walter Scott, paint this figure of a gentleman. Right in place of Sidney and Scott, Chikamatsu and Bakin, and you have in a nutshell the main features of the literary history of Japan. The innumerable avenues of popular amusement and instruction, the theaters, the storytellers' booths, the preacher's dais, the musical recitations, the novels, have taken for their chief theme the stories of the samurai. The peasants round the open fire in their huts never tire of repeating the achievements of Yoshitsune and his faithful retainer Benkei, or of the two brave Soga brothers. The dusky urchins listen with gaping mouths until the last stick burns out and the fire dies in its embers, still leaving their hearts aglow with the tale that is told. The clerks and the shop boys, after their day's work is over, and the amado, the shutters of the store are closed, gather together to relate the story of Nobunaga and Hideyoshi far into the night until slumber overtakes their weary eyes and transports them from the drudgery of the counter to the exploits of the field. The very babe just beginning to toddle is taught to lisp the adventures of Momotaro, the daring conqueror of Ogre Land. Even girls are so imbued with the love of knightly deeds and virtues that, like Desdemona, they would seriously incline to devour with greedy ear the romance of the samurai. The samurai grew to be the beau ideal of the whole race. As among flowers the cherry is queen, so among men the samurai is lord. So sang the populace. Debarred from commercial pursuits, the military class itself did not aid commerce. But there was no channel of human activity, no avenue of thought which did not receive in some measure an impetus from Bushido. Intellectual and moral Japan was directly or indirectly the work of knighthood. Mr. Malik, in his exceedingly suggestive book, Aristocracy and Evolution, has eloquently told us that social evolution, insofar as it is other than biological, may be defined as the 
unintended result of the intentions of great men. Further, that historical progress is produced by a struggle not among the community generally to live, but a struggle amongst a small section of the community to lead, to direct, to employ the majority in the best way. Whatever may be said about the soundness of his argument, these statements are amply verified in the part played by Bouchy in the social progress, as far as it went, of our empire. How the spirit of Bushido permeated all social classes is also shown in the development of a certain order of men known as otokodate, the natural leaders of democracy. Staunch fellows were they, every inch of them strong with the strength of massive manhood. At once the spokesmen and the guardians of popular rights, they had each a following of hundreds and thousands of souls who proffered in the same fashion that samurai did to daimyo, the willing service of limb and life, of body, chattels, and earthly honor. Backed by a vast multitude of rash and impetuous working men, these born bosses formed a formidable check to the rampancy of the two-sworded order. In manifold ways has Bushido filtered down from the social class where it originated and acted as leaven among the masses, furnishing a moral standard for the whole people. The precepts of knighthood, begun at first as the glory of the elite, became in time an aspiration and inspiration to the nation at large. And though the populace could not attain the moral height of those loftier souls, yet Yamato Damashi, the soul of Japan, ultimately came to express the Volksgeist of the island realm. If religion is no more than morality touched by emotion, as Matthew Arnold defines it, few ethical systems are better entitled to the rank of religion than Bushiro. Motoori has put the mute utterance of the nation into words when he sings, Isles of blessed Japan. Should your Yamato spirit strangers seek to scan, say, scenting morn's sunlit air, blows the cherry wild and fair. Yes, the sakura, the cherry blossom, has for ages been the favorite of our people and the emblem of our character. Mark particularly the terms of definition which the poet uses, the words, the wild cherry flower scenting the morning sun. The Yamato spirit is not a tame, tender plant, but a wild, in the sense of natural, growth. It is indigenous to the soil. Its accidental qualities it may share with the flowers of other lands, but in its essence it remains the original, spontaneous outgrowth of our clime. But its nativity is not its sole claim to our affection. The refinement and grace of its beauty appeal to our aesthetic sense as no other flower can. We cannot share the admiration of the Europeans for their roses, which lack the simplicity of our flower. Then, too, the thorns that are hidden beneath the sweetness of the rose. The tenacity with which she clings to life as though loath were afraid to die, rather than drop untimely, preferring to rot on her stem. Her showy colors and heavy odors, all these are traits so unlike our flower, which carries no dagger or poison under its beauty, which is ever ready to depart life at the call of nature, whose colors are never gorgeous, and whose light fragrance never palls. Beauty of color and of form is limited in its showing. It is a fixed quality of existence, whereas fragrance is volatile, ethereal as the breathing of life. So in all religious ceremonies, frankincense and myrrh play a prominent part. 
There is something spirituel in redolence. When the delicious perfume of the sakura quickens the morning air, as the sun in its course rises to illumine first the isles of the Far East, few sensations are more serenely exhilarating than to inhale, as it were, the very breath of beauteous day. When the Creator himself is pictured as making new resolutions in his heart upon smelling a sweet savor, Genesis 8.21, is it any wonder that the sweet-smelling season of the cherry blossom should call forth the whole nation from their little habitations? Blame them not, if for a time their limbs forget their toil and moil and their hearts their pangs and sorrows. Their brief pleasure ended, they returned to their daily tasks with new strength and new resolutions. Thus in ways more than one is the sakura the flower of the nation. Is, then, this flower so sweet and evanescent, blown whithersoever the wind listeth, and shedding a puff of perfume ready to vanish forever? Is this flower the type of the Yamato spirit? Is the soul of Japan so frailly mortal? Is Bushido still alive? Or has Western civilization in its march through the land already wiped out every trace of its ancient discipline?